So I told you guys I'm going to be awarding people that kind of take my thought to try and create a game with quads or something else other than freestyle and racing with quads to kind of the next level, show you know creativity, show skill, show something. This guy actually put real work and effort into this. He came up with this tetrahedron design, which he 3D printed these, these, these endpoints for the plastic straws that he's using to fit into and create these little tetrahedron geometries for his micro or mini quads to pick up. And he's actually pretty good at it too. So one of these frames is new. Can you spot the difference between the two? <laughs> Maybe not really. So what I've got here is the floss style, the original floss style with the lighter arms before I actually beefed up the arms. And then I have my new design, which is, I don't have a name for it, but I'm contemplating naming it Glide, but it's pretty much a blending of the floss style and the flow ride. It has individual arms. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I've already posted pictures of it. Um, I'm working on this frame. This is not a complete frame. It's a work in progress. It is going to be months before it comes out. Um, I usually don't kind of discuss everything I'm doing with the frame and all my kind of like tests, but I will in this case just because I'm planning on making this a premium frame and I'm going to show you some of the carbons that I'm looking at as well in a minute. So the main difference between these two designs is that the arms of the floss style have been moved to the inside. And my goal here is to drop the top plate. As I tried to do with this design here, which I've abandoned because it's just too darn difficult to build. As you can see, it's very compact and constricted inside there. This frame <clears throat> is trying to get the battery and GoPro a little bit lower to see if I can get improvements in handling without inducing that effect that I get when I have the battery and GoPro right between the blades and the thrust just bumps directly into the battery and the GoPro and it gives you this kind of attrition of, of performance in kind of general performance. <clears throat> What's interesting is that I actually talked to um, Umagod about this and he said that that description that I was describing to him of that kind of nullified performance, he, he actually sees that as neutral which is fine, which shows you how big of a preference difference there might be. But the reason why I call it a detractive quality is because if I took this frame here and just wrapped the body in tape, then I would induce that effect. And I haven't dropped the battery, I haven't dropped the GoPro, and that tells me that there's probably something else going on. And my best theory behind it is that the thrust is bumping into the middle of the of the just the solid wall it doesn't have space to go and the blades are acting like they're in a more static environment which is generally not good and it doesn't make a huge difference but to me when I'm flying around my little trees and branches I really want really fine control and fine feel so did dropping the battery and GoPro seven millimeters make a difference all I did was move the arms on top of this carbon plate. So that's five millimeter of arm plus two millimeter of base plate, that's seven millimeters. So I dropped this seven millimeters. Did it make a difference? Nah, a little bit. I can, I can feel a slight improvement in my roll performance, but not drastic. Where I do think it would help is if I ran very big batteries on this frame versus this frame. If I ran like an 1800 or a 1500 milliamp 6S battery, both of these are 6S builds, then of course this is gonna be better because the battery weight and the GoPro weight are closer to the prop line, are closer to the CG of the frame, and you should feel at least some improvement. With that being said, having the arms on the inside of the frame kind of restricts it to a 20 by 20 build only. You can fit a, a single 30 by 30, normal size 30 by 30 um, board in the middle here, but primarily you're gonna have to run 20 by 20 boards. And I don't know why I didn't realize that, but what this frame showed me was that anytime that you have to build inside of a cavity of a frame, it makes it incredibly difficult to build and just annoying to serve, extremely annoying to service. So same thing is evident with this. You have the arms bulging up here and you have to build inside the cavity in order to get that dropped build height and get the arms inside and get it seven millimeter lower. And I'm not so sure it's actually worth it. I don't think it, it does look better. I mean, that's probably the biggest benefit is that it looks more compressed and condensed and it does look a lot better, but I don't, I don't think it's really helping too much in performance and I would rather have it be much easier to build. So I think the direction that I'm gonna go is that I'm gonna move the arms again back towards the bottom and um, 
I'm going to give you the option of modifying this brace plate like I have on the bottom of the floss dial so that you can decide if you want to <clears throat> move the arms inside and get that kind of really condensed look because it is at this point it is no longer even close to a beginner build it's a very not advanced high advanced build but it's a very frustrating build and this is one that I abandoned the build it was just too difficult and on top of that this one has the run cam racer camera in which they have kind of it seems like they've discontinued the use of the controller to change the settings in the camera so you have to use RX and TX my goal with this frame is to make a premium frame because people have been talking about or wanting or asking me for a premium frame. They say, why don't you make a premium frame? Oh yeah, as an example here, I'll show you this frame here. So this is the floss style build, my typical floss style builds, which are you know, really nice and open and free and flowing and very easy to build. You can see it's very clean. I got a 30 by 30 4 one that's the uh, Hobbywing 4-in-1 stack, or just the ESC. It's very good. It's one of the best uh, 6S ESCs that I've used. And then I have the VTX on top flight control in the back everything's very clean perfect and the camera wires right here it's really a clean build so I'd like to keep that although I'll talk about although in a second but let's talk about the carbon quality next so these are the various carbon qualities that I have I'm always looking for new, for better carbon always looking for better always looking for better materials over carbon actually so this one on top that you're first looking at this is the regular hyperlight carbon that we're using it's not it's absolutely not the very best carbon on the market at all, but I have tested much, much higher end Torre 1200 or whatever 100 carbon, and I haven't actually, in use, I haven't seen a major improvement. So that's why I haven't stepped up to those different carbon levels. And that's why I use this carbon because it's more cost effective and it really is no different in terms of performance and use. But people want a premium frame, so we have stepped it up. So these two carbons are a higher Torre and a higher quality, just come from a different company and are, much, are supposed to be much higher carbon. As you can see, this carbon on top, it looks kind of rough. The one in the middle is actually the same kind of oil, oil rubbed finish as Astro X, and um, that's probably the one we will go with. It's very clean. It has zero carbon dust anywhere on it. The third one is a gloss dipped finish, and I personally, when I first saw this, it, it was kind of tacky to me and I thought it looked very Chinese and very low quality but when I held it more and I compared the two I was like I actually like this gloss a lot I think it gives it a really like cool looking finish and then I started scraping it up to see if it would make a difference in terms of uh, of wear to wear and tear and it really doesn't make a big difference at all so tell me what you think about the gloss versus more of a matte finish it's a very soft kind of satin rubbery feeling finish of course it's going to be chamfered everything's going to be chamfered and one it'll either have this uh, oil rubbed finish or this gloss finish this does cost a lot more to produce but it's still not going to be a lot a whole lot more to, to sell we're probably going to sell it for sixty dollars sixty five dollars probably at the most i wouldn't expect it to cost too much more so now let's stem across that and talk about props. So before I talk about this prop, let's talk about this prop. This is the B Rotor 5055. It is a well-balanced prop. There is nothing more I can say about this prop. I do not recommend it. This is the Racecraft 5051 version 2. Now Racecraft has kind of been away for quite some time and they haven't made a new prop in, in quite a while. But this is the first prop they've made, and it's a return to the market. I would say they've done a pretty good job at creating a really well-balanced overall prop. It's not particularly good at anything except for prop wash handling, which we'll talk about in a second. But it's just got, it hits kind of all the points really, really nicely, and it doesn't have any major downfalls. It is not the best grip, but it's pretty good. It's not the best speed, but it's pretty good. It's not the best durability. It's using the kind of hard, Gracecraft plastic that they used to use in the previous props, which is fine. It holds up really well, it performs really well, but if you crash and bend it, you can't bend it back, or it has the ability to break if you hit something, especially if it's cold outside. Overall, it just does everything really well. It doesn't do anything poorly. It also does prop wash handling much better. Now, prop wash is something that's kind of disappeared <laughs> in time, like it just vanished thanks to the improvements in firmware. And this prop actually does an even better job of handling prop wash, so it's even easier to get a much smoother throttle control and response in the low to mid level of throttle, because that's usually where I get prop wash. So good job Racecraft for a prop to re-enter the market, but I think I'd like to see this prop in the 
newer 5.1 inch size because I just tend to like the 5.1 inch props more and maybe with a little bit less pitch to try and improve the efficiency a little bit and with the Popo Pro or the Popo Hub so that I can use it on the Popo Pro motor shafts which I still am hoping are going to be very good. Now next thing I want to stem into is uh, tuning. So Betaflight came out with their 3.5 and their new configurator and now there's all this feed forward, biz feed forward business and iTerm Relax and Smart Feed Forward and Throttle Boost and all this, they just kind of <laughs> gave it everything, gave everything to us immediately. I don't know why they just keep doing this, they just keep making it more and more and more complicated. But in general, I have played with all of it and I would say that, okay, so I'm showing you my settings on the screen and I'm going to talk about what each of them kind of do. And so what does feed forward do? Feed forward is a complete replacement for the throttle, or no, sorry, set point, D set point. Feed forward just completely replaces. It's a little bit different in, in actual academic way. It's a little bit different, but it does pretty much the same thing. The range is zero to 2000. You will never need 2000. If you put it on 2000, you will regret it. I did it once and the quad just, flips out like crazy. If you touch the roll or anything, it comes default at 60. And you still, and you're gonna have to play with it, but 60 to me felt like it was a little bit nervous. It felt like it was a little over, over not over compensatory, but it was just kind of reacting a little bit more than I wanted it to react. So I actually prefer it down to 45. 40 is a little bit low for me. 45 is good for me to get like nice smooth control. My uh, rate is still 1.3. It's been 1.3 for probably a year now, I think, more than a year now, and I'm really settled in that 1.3. Even my yaw, I've gotten used to using, even though I pinch and yaw is kind of more difficult for pinchers sometimes, or for me it actually has been, uh, I, I train myself to keep my, my everything at 1.3. So that's good for me. And then everything else is the PIDs, which I have tuned a little bit and improved a little bit, which I'll talk about in a second. But the next setting that I think is most useful to consider is the throttle boost. Now, throttle boost is very much like set point or feed forward for your throttle. None of these are really correct. I'm not explaining them correctly. I'm, I'm explaining everything in like layman's terms so that you can actually understand it. I read the academic explanation for them. I watched Bardwell's video. It was all very educational, informational, but it doesn't really help me in the real world. In the real world, what throttle boost and feed forward do is they kind of tweak how quick or agile the response is to your finger inputs. Feed forward, the higher the feed forward, the more exaggerated the response is to your finger movements. The higher the throttle boost, the more exaggerated the throttle boost is to your finger inputs. I like flying smooth. I like a very soft throttle. I like the throttle boost lower than normal. So number two or three is about right for me. Of course, different quads are totally different, but in general for acro quads, this is what I like for my kind of flying, what I do most of the time. And lastly, to finish off, I want to talk to you about a couple batteries. So these are some of my favorite batteries. These are the, these are the batteries, these are like kind of my go-to batteries. So previously, before I was moving to 6S, I was using this battery the most. This is the um, Multistar, Multistar, no, Mini Star. Oh, that's so interesting that it's so similar to Multistar. China Hobby Line Mini Star. I didn't even realize that till now. China Hobby Line Mini Star. This is a 172 gram battery. I think it's fantastic weight and the weight is very important to me because it goes on top of my quad for my acro quads and it feels excellent to have this 172 gram weight on top. If I wanna fly kind of wider quarters, more open area where I'm gonna be using more throttle, this 1500 milliamp Infinity battery is really, really good. It's 182 grams. It's also a very good weight. I do feel it a little bit more, but it's, it's okay, it's not bad. I don't feel too much negative uh, effect to my control and handling. This is, GNB 1100 milliamp battery. This, I don't know why when we move to 6S, people are moving to larger batteries. It does not make any sense to me. This is a 207 or 208 gram battery, and it has the same thickness of wire as well. They could go down in the gauge of this wire. What is this? This is 12 gauge wire. Come on. You can move down to 16 gauge, or probably even 18 gauge, and it wouldn't be any difference at all. With 6S and lower KV, 1600 to 1750 KV, you're not pulling the same kind of amps. You don't need wires so thick you can jump start a truck on. But this is a heavy battery, and at 200 and something grams, I definitely feel it on top of my quad. Now, if you're in a race quad, it's a different story. You need to finish the race, and now people are running 6S and higher KV, and they just wanna go faster and faster and faster, which is a little bit crazy but you know they're flying heavier quads and so you may actually need the 1100 milliamp and i think even 1300 milliamp uh, 6s is a normal battery for people to buy 
Me personally, I really only use these two batteries on 4S and I prefer the, 13, the, the 1300 battery for the lighter weight. This Pulse 1050 battery is my only 1050 battery. 1050 is a little bit more than 1500 milliamp 4S equivalent and this battery weighs 185 grams and it has smaller gauge wire. So it's kind of the perfect battery to me. Like I don't know why the 1050 hasn't become the standard for 6S. The biggest issue with 6S that I have had in the past trying it and testing it on, you know, years ago with low KV 6S is that the batteries were heavier, everything was bigger, you had to use bigger ESEs, everything generally weighed more. And as I said previously, weight is a really big factor to me. So weighing more is going to make it not as enjoyable for me to fly. And that was my biggest kind of downfall with 6S. That's why I kind of never really ventured into it. Recently, we have all the new tech that can do 6S. We have the 20 by 20 stacks that do 6S. Everything's freaking awesome. So I want that lower weight and that lower weight is the big benefit. Like I said, this 548 gram all up weight with GoPro, with ND filter and this 1050 milliamp 6S battery just feels incredible in the air, especially with these props. I feel like these props might be an, an, a, a uh, acceptable replacement for the T-Motor prop. It doesn't quite have the same kind of quickness and response and agility, but still a pretty good prop to me. And I like the smoothness of the prop wash handling. If I could tune better, then it wouldn't really matter to me, but I can't, so I'll deal with it. <laughs> Anyways, um, hope this was helpful. Sorry, I don't have anything new right now. I've just been really busy this week. I, I have a bunch of new stuff on my table, but I just don't have the time to think about it even. Anyways, floss your teeth. Take care.